type those in, please do so. All right, I'm not seeing any. Um, so I think I saw that Heather Villa's on, so we'll go ahead with the next talk. Um, Heather is a wildlife administrative chief for South Dakota Game, Fish and Parks, and she's going to be presenting on the impacts that COVID had on our license sales. Heather. Thanks, Casey. Thank you guys for having me here today. Um, so as Casey mentioned, I'm gonna be reporting out on hunting and fishing license sales specifically. So I think a lot of folks are going to speak to the impacts of COVID. Um, there were so many unknowns that came with it, and especially for fish and wildlife agencies. Um, as the country was shutting down, we were all wondering, is our agency going to shut down? Are we going to be closing down our services? Are we going to be limiting things? Um, so one of my points of pride working for South Dakota GFP is we are a self-funded agency where other agencies throughout the country, they may get general funds from their state government where we rely for the most part on license sales. And then of course the federal matches that we're able to get. So 2020 was really uh, an interesting year. And if you guys recall in 2019, we had record amounts of flooding and just standing water. So that certainly affected a lot of our license sales in 2019. And 2019 was truly just a really rough year for license sales. We were down quite a bit. So we were pretty fortunate that Governor Nome really spread the message that the outdoors are open, that you could go recreate safely, be outside where other states did not do that. They closed down parks, they closed down fishing ramps. Um, we did not have that. Um, fortunately, with COVID, we did have a lot of folks in South Dakota getting outside. Um, likely towards the beginning of shutdowns in early spring, there was a big focus I saw on non-residents. How many non-residents are coming here because they can't recreate in their own states? Um, so we have been pulling a lot of data throughout the year just to track that. And our non-resident numbers really were, were not incredibly high compared to previous years. So that was something that maybe folks were just paying more attention to, uh, kind of like when you buy a red car, you see everyone has red cars. So when we report on our license sales, you can also get any of these reports off of our website under our commission documents. Every time we have a commission meeting, we have these report outs and, uh, we also just recently did an annual report out. So I'd like to speak separately to the resident and non-resident side. So again, as 2019 was very low in sales, for 2020, when we compare our overall license sales to 2019, we were actually up 48%, which is a huge lift. So as you guys have heard hunting and fishing is declining nationally. It's a change in values, change in um, the ability just to get outside, have time together with your family. So we were really excited to see that big jump. Uh, what was interesting about it was we started comparing to a three-year average as opposed to year over year. And the reasoning for that was having such volatility from 2019. We also anticipated 2020 was going to be rocky. We didn't know if we were going to have great sales, if we were going to have low sales. So we wanted to make sure that we were using accurate information. So when we compare just our fishing licenses for residents to a three-year average, we were up about 5,000 licenses, which is pretty great. When we compare our small game licenses to a three-year average, we were up about 19,000 licenses, which is fantastic. Now, when you look at the non-resident side, um, compared to 2019, we were up 59.2%. Again, we didn't see a lot of non-residents in 2019 due to standing water, um, which meant that you know fields were getting harvested later and folks just simply weren't traveling um, because stuff wasn't out yet. So had to make sure they could get to birds and we saw some very uh, low numbers in 2019. 
So to be up 59.2% is really great. When looking at a three-year average, um, for our non-residents, our fishing licenses were up 12,000 licenses, which is just remarkable. Now on the other side, our small game licenses were down about 5,000 licenses. And that's when comparing to the three-year average. When we compare to 2019, our small game was pretty straight across the board. It was pretty comparable to 2019. But what we heard from some of the uh, like lodge operators was that they didn't have as many commercial groups coming in for pheasant hunting. Now, part of that was um, having restrictions company-wide coming from other states where they wouldn't allow their staff to travel or things like that. So we, we anticipated that. However, these are really strong numbers um, considering all the change, all the uncertainty that 2020 came with. Uh, we were really fortunate to come out of 2020 on a really positive spin. Now, the hope is with our three efforts that we can retain a lot of these folks and bring them into 2021. So we'll be watching that really closely coming up this next year just to see where are folks coming from. Are they the same people that have been participating in outdoor recreation in South Dakota? And what can we do to remove some of these barriers for them? I know that's very brief. If anyone has any questions on the licensing portion, I'd be glad to answer any. Um, if not, I'd also like to touch a little bit on some of our federal funding, if that's okay with you, Casey. Yeah, that'd be great. We've got plenty of time. We're heading ahead of schedule, so please feel free. Yeah. So as I stated, we receive a good majority of our funds from federal funds. Um, there's a federal excise tax on firearms, ammunition, fishing poles, bows, arrows, and that federal excise tax is collected at the manufacturer level. So those are Pittman Robertson dollars and Dingle Johnson dollars. So the Pittman Robertson dollars on the firearms side, those then go through a formula at the federal level. And that formula takes into account total acres as well as license sales. So again, when I say we're self-funded for the most part between license sales and our federal aid, we look to both of those things to try and increase our funds. So the better our license sales are, the stronger they are. We may have an opportunity to recoup more of these federal funds going through the formula that they take all the states through. So an interesting part of uh, 2020 with COVID-19, um, there were a lot of relief programs that were available for folks um, just because this was such an unforeseen circumstance and everything was so unique what we were going through. Firearm manufacturers, they were given a COVID relief package from the federal government, which was like a tax deferment. So similar to how when you were filing your own taxes, your income taxes, um, we didn't have that strict deadline that we typically have. We got an extension. The manufacturers did as well. So typically when these firearm manufacturers pay in their excise tax, they are paying it in in July. With this COVID relief package, they did not have to pay in until October. And South Dakota is not unique in this. Um, a lot of state agencies are seeing some cash flow change on the federal funding side, because if when they typically will dole that money back out to the states is October. So if the manufacturers typically pay in July and then the money goes back out to the states in October, but this year they didn't pay till October. So the money that we received this year in October was just from those manufacturers that had voluntarily paid early. So with that, there were, the apportionments were not as large as they typically are. So with the preliminary apportionment being in, in October, the final apportionment typically comes in February. So those final apportionments are generally going to be about 25% on top of the uh, preliminary apportionment, at least for South Dakota. This year, what we saw was about a 75% apportionment for our final apportionment on top of our preliminary. So while our preliminary apportionment 
was quite a bit lower, our final apportionment was higher. So you're seeing a lot of states that are trying to react to this and figure out how you make the cash flow work with the change in the COVID relief delays, essentially. So a lot of you I'm sure have seen there's not much for firearms, there's not much for ammunition, fishing pools, equipment out on the shelves. So some of this is either because of manufacturing delays. We have to keep in mind that um, there's been shortage of all kinds of things this year, right? Toilet paper was a hot commodity at one point. So as these manufacturers are um, trying to get their products out, they also are experiencing some of these shortages. Um, so the hope is that they have consistent manufacturing. So then when they're shipping stuff out of their factories, they're able to remit that tax. They're not going to have any delay in production, but also we have to be cognizant of where the manufacturers are located. Uh, a lot of states gave orders of what qualifies as an essential business. Now, I think we all know that we should likely expect delays in some of the manufacturing chains if the state concluded that that business was not essential. So I think think that would speak to some of the shortages we're seeing on the shelves. And this is all just my speculation. So keep that in mind. Um, but I think we're going to see states being a little more creative with their funding and trying to stretch it a little further just because of this cash flow coming at different times. Um, now in South Dakota, obviously, we have certain times where we can't do construction, where we can't put some of this money on the ground because you have frozen ground, you have frozen water. So if we're trying to do boat ramp repairs and that money doesn't come in when it typically does, where we have to stretch funds and kind of shuffle around the checkbook, we certainly can do that. But it's just going to take a few years of uh, being a little more reactive, I guess, to it. And I anticipate we're going to see some of this volatility for maybe the next three to five years as we work out what the new normal, you know, the, the buzz phrase of 2020, <clears throat> we're going to be experiencing a new normal as well. Um, just figuring out our funding cycles and how it's going to affect our day to day. Any questions? Thank you, Heather. Any questions for Heather? Feel free to chat those in. I'm not seeing any yet. All right, not seeing any. Thanks again for um, coming to talk with us. Really appreciate it.